Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden of Witts University in Johannesburg, South Africa. Very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, today we're going to talk about uh, SEZ, Special Economic Zones, and this has been a topic that has come in and out of our conversation over the years with various guests as we've talked about special economic zones being proposed by the Chinese in places like Ethiopia, in Zambia, in Nigeria, and then there's the case of Mauritius. And in some ways, Mauritius offers an interesting cautionary tale about SEZs. But I think before we get into this conversation, let me just kind of back up and talk about what is an SEZ and why it's so important to the Chinese. You know, the Chinese are using their own development model, and this is a theory that's been propagated by uh, none other than Deborah Baudigam, who talks about how the Chinese in Africa, rather than using the Western development model, have been kind of relying on their own experience and their own instincts. And special economic zones are a very important part of their economic history over the past 30 years. What China did back in the, oh gosh, I want to say late 80s, early 90s, I think it was the early 90s is when it started. Started, is they created five designated areas. One was Shenzhen, for example, right on the border with Hong Kong, where it really was a special economic zone. And what that meant was there were different tariffs for manufacturers to come in and out. There was easier for foreigners to settle there. Uh, the rules were kind of loosened, if you will, and there was special treatment for the people and the businesses in those areas. And what that did is it created a lot of economic activity. So what the Chinese have been doing is taking that model to Africa and really talking it up. Naturally, a lot of people are very excited about it. But in Mauritius, it all went wrong. And one person who's been covering this is James Wan, who is the former editor at Think Africa Press and the new editor of African Arguments, which is uh, the online publication of the Royal African Society. And it's an online magazine that features news analysis, essays, and everything that you liked about Think Africa Press. Well, now <laughs> go check out African Arguments. Uh, James, you've been on the show before, so we're thrilled to have you back. Yeah, it's great to be back. Well, and it's also wonderful to bring you back on this particular topic because we're going to be talking about Mauritius and you yourself are of Mauritian descent, am I correct? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Uh, yeah, my is all from Mauritius. And, wonderful. Yeah. So you'll be able to speak with a little bit of, uh, of authority on the subject. Now, you've done a, a couple reporting trips there when you go back to see, uh, to see some of your relatives and the like. And one of them that you talked about was this uh, 2006 announcement of a special economic zone that was announced back then with the Chinese private company uh, Tianli Spinning. Tell us the little bit of the background of the SEZ before we get into the details of why it all went wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So it was at the yeah, FOCAC in 2006 that Hu Jintao kind of announced that he wanted to set up, or China wanted to set up, a, a handful of special economic zones across Africa. Um, and that led to different governments and companies kind of pitching their versions, basically. And one of those, I mean, a lot of those kind of made a lot of sense, uh, like an Ethiopian one, where, you know, there's cheap labor, lots of cheap labor and a big kind of internal market or Zambia with its uh, kind of rich copper reserves. Um, but Mauritius also proposed one based on kind of a very different kind of set of uh, advantages, I suppose. So yeah, it was between the Mauritian government and this company called Tianli Spinning. And the idea was that this special economic zone with its kind of lower regulations and taxes uh, would attract kind of higher end industries that Mauritius wants to diversify into. So things like ICTs, uh, kind of specialist light manufacturing, um, pharmaceuticals, that kind of thing. And, you know, they pushed it pretty hard and eventually they got uh, the approval from Beijing. Uh, and there was a lot of hope for it. People said, or at least the government said, it was going to create, you know, 40,000 jobs. It was going to help Mauritius uh, add value um, and diversify further. But, yeah, but it didn't quite work out that way. And when we were there, it was essentially roads laid out and goats kind of grazing in between them and nothing much else, right? Yeah. So it's, a, it's an area, I think it's 211 hectares which isn't huge by most standards, but when you're talking about this tiny uh, kind of speck in the Indian Ocean, uh, it's, it's quite a lot of, you know, it's a, it's a considerable part of the island. 
Um, and there were kind of small scale farmers that had, plant, had been planting there that had to be removed. Um, and the agreement was that the government would build the infrastructure around the site uh, and the companies would be responsible for building the infrastructure on the site. Um, and that basically has been done. Um, so, yeah, when you when you go around it, there are these big roads, um, well lit, uh, you know, smooth tarmac, really, you know, amazing roads. Um, but there's basically nothing else there. So people people use it. The only the only thing it's really used for is people kind of go there if they want to have a little cultural occasion. They want somewhere that's uh, kind of nice and quiet. Uh, or you see people like practicing their three point turns on it. Um, and you occasionally see, you know, <laughs> what a brand new road there. I, I can yeah. imagine the Chinese kind of pitch on this and they, you know, the PowerPoint presentation is like, look at Shenzhen 1990, look at Shenzhen today, special economic zone. This could be your city, you know, fill in the blank here. And, mm. and it's interesting to me because the SEZs have run into problems uh, in Zambia. They've run into problems in a lot of places in Africa. So something is clearly going wrong between the pitch and the execution. Um, and, and I'm just kind of, let's take the, the Mauritius example, because when I look at, I mean, I, had to, I have to be honest with you, I had to go back onto Google Maps and look where Mauritius was on the map. Um, you, you were being generous, I think, when you called it a speck in the, in the Indian Ocean. I mean, this thing is tiny. I mean, it makes, it makes you know, Madagascar look huge. Can, you know, so it's tiny. And so one has to think, okay, what was anybody thinking that this was going to be a good launch pad for the Chinese into the rest of Africa or elsewhere? I mean, what was the, the strategic value for a company like you know, Tianli Spinning and the Chinese to be there? And why did the, the Mauritians think that this would actually come to, to fruition? Mm. Well, from Mauritius' perspective, I think there were kind of two things. So firstly, uh, it basically, this kind of model worked really well for it in the 70s and 80s. So back then they had not special economic zones, but what they called export processing zones. Um, and they set up these, yeah, in the 70s, and that attracted quite a few... Uh, Chinese and particularly Hong Kong based textile factories were um, and the advantage for them as well as the kind of uh, low tax and low regulations um, was that there was cheap labor and also market access kind of pre preferential market access to Africa, Europe, uh, the US uh, because of things like the multi fiber trade agreement um, and that actually worked really well for Mauritius. Um, and allowed it to diversify from being what was essentially a monocrop sugar-based economy uh, into also having quite a thriving textile uh, industry. So one of the arguments when the government announced it was kind of just looking back at history and saying, you know, we did it. We did it in the 70s and 80s. We're doing it again. The other thing is that, yeah, so I think from Mauritius perspective, it, it perhaps rightly thinks that it does have various advantages. Um, so, you know, back in the 80s, it was cheap labor and market access. Now, it can argue that it's, when it comes to Africa, it's, you know, the most stable, democratic uh, country, you know, it always comes top of the Mo Ibrahim governance indicators. Um, it's got a well-educated population, uh, a multilingual population. And I think it kind of wants to set itself up as like a stepping stone between uh, Africa and China. So it can kind of say like, we're technically African and we have access to all those markets, but we're also, you have all the advantages of, you know, setting up in a European country. Like it's very easy to do business, uh, educated workforce, uh, good infrastructure, this, that, and the other. So, so I was wondering, so why didn't it work? I mean, when you list the, the reasons like that, it, it, all, it all sounds very convincing. Um, why, what was the problem in the end? Hmm. So I think it was, I think one of the problems was just that uh, uh, it kind of happened at an awkward time. So it was agreed upon in 2006, I think. Um, and then they started they started building stuff. And then in the kind of 2007-8 financial crash, uh, everything kind of stalled and slowed down. 
uh, they were worried about whether they'd be able to attract uh, businesses. I think Tianli Spinning, the, the main company involved, uh, was having some kind of uh, liquidity problems. So it kind of stalls. And then when um, the Mauritian government met with the Chinese government to try to kind of hurry it, hurry it up again, uh, Hu Jintao essentially handed over responsibility to one of the provinces that got two other big Chinese companies involved. Um, and they were quite strange choices. They were both like big kind of resource extraction companies. Um, and they essentially took majority uh, shareholding over the over the the SEZ, uh, and it kind of changed its aims from being this kind of high tech hub into being more of a kind of hospitality place. Um, and I think that doesn't really attract Chinese business people um, because that's not. I mean, they're not. I, I I think one of the ideas was that companies would set up in Mauritius where everything's very you know, nice and beautiful and works really well, great infrastructure, but they'd really be doing business in Africa. But kind of as we can see from uh, big Chinese companies going straight into Africa where, you know, things are maybe a bit more uncertain, like they're not, they're not really afraid of, of taking some risks. Um, so, I th- so I think that was one of the reasons that it was kind of the reformulation of it. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting cars. because on what we've been hearing for the past year or two is how the Chinese may be kind of shying away from some of the riskier areas like South Sudan, uh, the DRC, and opting for more stable areas. Now, we've always interpreted that as being South Africa, Tanzania, Kenya, whatnot. So it seems like Mauritius would be ideal, but I guess the the distance is and, and the size of the island you know, gets in its way and works against it. Let's step back from Mauritius a little bit and kind of draw on some of your broader African experience to kind of look at someone looking at what happened with this SEZ, as they look at the other cases of SEZs that have run into problems, particularly in Zambia, Nigeria, and Ethiopia, what are what lessons should someone walk away with and take from the experience in Mauritius? I mean, I think, I think what's important is, I mean, what I think what didn't really work that well in Mauritius is the fact that the the partners involved, I think, didn't always have exactly the same kind of incentives and the same plans. Um, so that meant that when it started to kind of falter um, and other partners got involved, it, it, it kind of changed. And I think right from the start, the Beijing wasn't really that um, excited about the Mauritius SEZ. I mean, I think it was very strongly pushed by the Mauritian government itself. Um, And I think when these SEZs work best, it's when corporations uh, partner with governments and those corporations have very clear ideas of what it is uh, they're able to get and what it is that uh, kind of what they want to do with it. And one of the problems with the SEZ in Mauritius as well is that the main companies involved weren't used to, they weren't specialists in kind of setting up these kinds of zones. So I think that expertise also also comes into uh, – is, is also extremely important. Kobus, let me ask a question to you about the kind of perception and the optics of a Chinese SEZ in – we're saying SEZ and SEZ, by the way, so you can tell who's American <laughs> and who's, uh, who, who's Brit. Um, but, you know, the optics of it all, because you know that – there's all this sensitivity about, you know, we, Chinese neocolonialism, Chinese kind of taking over, Chinese, you know, blah, 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 blah. But yet this idea that China has a kind of a, a specific territory zoned off for itself, it's got its name, it's got its companies there. Do you think that that could cause potential problems and just in terms of the marketing perception and the difficulties that the Chinese would have in communicating what exactly this is and how kind of critics may look at it as yet another encroachment on African agency and sovereignty? I think potentially there is that problem. Um, I think it especially comes in in relation to labor. Um, you know, I think there has been perceptions that um, that SEZs tend to, you know, kind of also mean 
that that labor laws are relaxed you know that labor laws are kind of um, upended within within their territory um, so that of course plays into wider issue wider concerns about you know Chinese companies um, and to and to which extent do they follow African labor law um, but you know kind of as always in Africa it, it always bumps up against the need to create more jobs. Um, you know, kind of, so there's always this kind of double discourse of, on the one hand, our work is being exploited. Um, on, on the other hand, you know, kind of no one has enough work to do, you know. Um, so it, it very much depends then on, on, on which of those discourses happen to play the hardest in particular society, um, you know, kind of, and, and, and who, are, who are pushing those two different, those different, different messages. Um, you know, kind of to, to move on from there, um, James, I was wondering, do you foresee that there is a, a, a future for this, for the, the Mauritian one? Um, I, you know, kind of midway through July, there was, I, I, I caught a, a press release saying that there's a, the Mauritian government signed a new memorandum, memorandum of understanding um, with uh, Jim Fay. Um, and uh, you know, kind of, and that they, it's going to be a smaller, smaller zone. They're reconfiguring the shape, and it's going to be light manufacturing and dry port, free dry port facilities, and so on and so on. Um, you know, kind of, is this just throwing more money, throwing more good money after bad, or do you do you see that there's a way to actually make this work? Um, I think they kind of have to make it work in to, to an extent they kind of have to do something with the land and the infrastructure they've built um and i think so when i so my understanding of the way they're trying to reconfigure it is actually take away a lot of the chinese uh ownership of it and make it actually 80 percent. i think it is 80 percent government owned and only 20 percent uh owned by the jinfei company that was kind of set up to to run it um and i think uh, i think that could be uh, really beneficial, and I think if they do look towards things like like manufacturing and uh, port infrastructure, uh, which are obviously two. I mean, when it comes to ports, obviously it's it's near the sea, so it's got an advantage there. And I think in terms of light manufacturing, you need the kind of infrastructure and expertise and education and like trained workforce to do that. So again, Mauritius, compared to most of the rest of the continent, has those advantages. Um, so I think, yeah, I mean, I think there's definitely potential. I don't think that the whole idea of it was doomed from the start. Um, and I think maybe making it less of a kind of Chinese SEZ and more of a, you know, just uh, a hub in the same way that Mauritius is trying to develop itself as a hub for kind of uh, biotechnology research and pharmaceuticals. Uh, I, I mean, I think there's potential there. You, men you mentioned that... Uh that Hu Jintao, the former president, made an issue of SEZs during the third forum on China-Africa cooperation back in 2006. Uh, the sixth forum on China-Africa cooperation is coming up in December. Xi Jinping will be in Johannesburg with what I presume to be every African leader and head of state. Do you think that, and based on what you've seen over the past 10 years or nine years or so, do you think that um, Xi Jinping will bring up SEZs and keep that on the agenda? I don't know about that. I mean, it seems to have been, the idea of them seems to have been um, a bit of a mixed bag, I'd say, across the continent. I mean, I, I don't know nearly as much about, uh, you know, the ones in Ethiopia and Nigeria and Zambia. But my understanding is, they, is, that, is that they've all been kind of slower to take off than originally envisioned. But that... Um, some of them are, I think, particularly the one in Ethiopia and uh, Nigeria, have uh, started to progress in the way that was hoped. I mean, I yeah, I mean, I I don't know really about that and okay. how much of a part it plays in in President C's uh, idea, but uh, yeah, I mean, do, what, what do you guys think? I tend to think they're, they're going to hold on to this idea, and they may not put it front and center, but I think it'll be as part of their, their economic engagement platform. Kobus, what's your, what's your guess? Yeah, I would guess the same thing. Um, yeah, it's, it's actually very difficult for me to say. Um, you know, kind of uh, seeing that, the, that they haven't been doing so well in, in, in Africa, I would not be surprised if they kind of get sidelined and kind of, you know, kind of quietly, quietly sidelined, you know? But, but um, here's the only reason I don't think that will happen. 
is it's so core to their own experience. And again, I'm, I'm going back to Braudigam's kind of thinking here the, of how they develop, that to abandon that entirely may be kind of some refutation of their own development experience. Maybe. But I wonder if they're still needed. You know, I mean, there's so many Chinese companies in, you know, kind of in in, in so many sectors at once in Africa. Do they still really still yeah. need a specific zone with specific kind of labor laws and tax laws? Or are they just like arriving and setting up shop in, you know, kind of where, where other companies are? Well, if they can get preferential tax treatment, they're going to take that. I mean, certainly yeah. they want to get lower. They want to lower their taxes. So, yeah, no, definitely. definitely so one, yeah. one thing to think about. Hey, if everybody you want have some background on this, uh, James did an excellent piece called Rise and Stall, China Stepping Stone to Nowhere, which is about the experience of the SEZ in, uh, in, in it wasn't in Port Louis, but it was in Mauritius. Uh, it's mm-hmm. a fantastic article over in African Business. So just go to AfricanBusinessMagazine.com. We'll also put a link to that in our show notes uh, on our site at ChinaAfricaProject.com. And, uh, you know, James, listen, thank you so much for joining us to talk about the issue of SEZs. We will keep the topic alive, especially going into the FOCAC Summit uh, in December. Until then, though, uh, if we'd like to follow your new adventures uh, that you're embarking on, over at uh, the Royal African Society and also on Twitter. What's the best way for everybody to stay in touch with you? Yeah, you can follow me on Twitter at uh, James J. Wan. Um, and you can follow African Arguments on Twitter at Africa Arguments. And once again, that's African Arguments, if I'm correct, on the website. Uh, let me just pull yeah. up the website, AfricanArguments.com, uh, AfricanArguments.org. Uh, really one of the best resources out there for uh, all things Africa. And uh, so we're just, we wish you the very best as you embark on this new adventure. And we're really looking forward to being in touch with you uh, going forward and, and really talking more about both Mauritius and, uh, and what you're doing over at African Arguments. Great. And Thanks Kobus, if people want to follow what you're doing these days, what's the best way for them to stay in touch with you? You'll see me on our Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash China Africa Project. Um, and we aggregate a 24 hour a day feed of China Africa news. Um, so if you want to stay on top of China Africa news, that's where you find it. And also I'm on Twitter at Stadnesk. That's S T A D N E S Q U E. And you can find me on Twitter as well. I'm at E O Lander, E O L A N D E R. I'm also on Weibo. At uh, I've got a personal Weibo at Weibo.com, Dabizi uh, Wai, and also Zhongfei uh, Xiangmu. So you can follow us if you speak Chinese over on Weibo. And of course, if you want to follow this podcast, the best way to do it is just go to iTunes, type in China and Africa, and we'll come right up there in the uh, in the search results. That's the easiest way to find us. And we would be so grateful if you could leave us uh, just kind of a comment or a, a rating because it makes it easier for other people to discover our show and to find the program. So we'll be back again very soon with another edition of the China in Africa podcast. Thank you so much for listening.